I, I look forward to there being a ceremony where you like hand over, I don't know, the scepter or, or what other symbol there is to, to signify, um, you know, this. Uh, okay, so. Um, oh, I got a clock there. Oh, but it's counting down from 40 seconds. Uh, yeah, it doesn't go about 40. Okay, so um, thank you, uh, folks, for um, you know also humoring um, uh, languages that are perhaps newcomers to the HPC ecosystem. Uh, so I will remind folks: Python used to be a newcomer, uh, and um, uh, yeah. So Julia is in, in some ways a newcomer to the HPC uh, uh, ecosystem. Um, I really like this uh, quote from Marius Malaya. Um, I know I'm not allowed to walk away from the podium, but if you look at the bottom there, he said that uh, Julia plus Jupiter plus GPUs equals, you know, lots of science and happiness. Um, and so that's really the, the reason why I care about uh, um, uh, Julia and, um, uh, and also Python and things like that. We, are, we actually like each other, and I'll explain why in a second. But first, I want to um, thank folks that, that I've collaborated with. This work would have uh, not been possible without any of these fine people and more. But these are the people that uh, I'm uh, able to remember. Uh, uh, you know, if, if given two minutes to make the slide real quick. Um, <clears throat> and uh, for folks that are interested in uh, Julia for HPC, I, I incredibly, you know, strongly, I, I cannot overemphasize the importance of the Julia HPC community. Uh, we have uh, a GitHub organization, we have a website, we have monthly uh, Zoom calls, and we, we have boffs and tutorials and so on, for example, at Supercomputing at JuliaCon. Uh, and so if you're interested in this space and have time, um, I recommend that you participate in these activities. Um, all right, this is the overview of my talk. It's a lot of material. So if we don't get to the very end of it, um, you can look at the slides. Uh, the first half is really hopefully enough to get you started. Um, so Julian, 60 seconds. So in case you haven't actually uh, used Julia before, it is a high productivity uh, language. It has all the modern high productivity features like a rich standard library, garbage collection, and things like that. It comes with an incredibly powerful REPL. Um, actually, most people that I know use the Jupyter kernel, uh, but the REPL is actually incredibly uh, feature rich. So uh, please try that if you haven't already. It has an, a comprehensive package manager. This is actually one of the things why I tend to gravitate towards Julia over Python, because uh, the package manager lets you do fun things like what you can see. Uh, you can see my mouse, great. Um, where you, where um, us sysadmins can go and uh, tell mpi.jl where to find all the libraries. And then any user who installs that library, um, they would have to do a lot of hard work to ignore those preferences. So they can't accidentally install a vanilla mpage that doesn't talk to our network. Um, same with CUDA, by the way. And then uh, finally, this is, this is something really uh, awesome in, when, when it comes to actually hacking uh, performance. Um, Julia is LLVM under the hood, and therefore um, you can make native calls to C, oops, to C functions with the C call macro. So here we can just call the clock function out of uh, the uh, glibc. And you can even say, uh, you can even interrogate what LLVM has done. And you can see that um, this gets translated to an LLVM call. Uh, um, and this is just a pointer offset to that location in glibc. And then it returns a integer. Um, Julia has an um, incredibly powerful type system. The type system is uh, reminiscent of C more than C++ uh, in the sense that you have structs for structured data and functions don't live in the structs, they, they act on the structs. So, so it will be clear in a second what I mean with that. So here is a struct and I can template that struct. So this T is a template parameter and it can be any number 
And then I can instantiate that uh, by constructing a, a instance of that struct. And you can see that depending on the inputs here, i.e. the template parameter, the type of um, that internal field has changed. I mentioned that the class system is slightly different. Uh, it's called multiple dispatch. And what I basically mean with that is you have a function called f in this example, and it has two implementations. Those two implementations are selected by the input types. So uh, that's why uh, the, in the parlance of Julia, we call this uh, f is a function and it has two methods. And the methods don't live in the class, but the methods live in a module. And depending on the inputs, you pick what method. So uh, in Python, you'd go, you know, class dot my method. Well, um, you can now make this, you can imagine a scenario where I have multiple input arguments and I want to have a different method depending on the different combinations rather than whatever class I called it from. So that's what I, uh, what I find super powerful. And for scientific algorithms, this is actually a very natural way to, pro uh, to, to, to implement problems. All right, so uh, that was more than 60 seconds. <laughs> Um, so uh, now I want to uh, just take a little step back and uh, ask ourselves why why nurse cares about Julia. And um, I, uh, Rahit inspired me to steal the slide from another deck, uh, but the important uh, message here that I want to um, focus on is that workflows are becoming much more integrated, right? So you you'll we are seeing in the future. Uh, um, workflows at NERSC where AI is intimately involved with some simulation, which which has is 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 guided by some uh, data driven exploration, and so um, uh, the the focus there is you have many different uh, paradigms, many different uh, algorithms, and we want to make them in uh, work closely together. And I think Julia is a great language for helping you do that because um, of well, of what you will see next. And so um, I want to show this slide here because I think Julia and Python are friends. Um, so if you if you really think of workflows as a way of taking the silicon and making it easily usable or bringing it closer to the human, then uh, the languages and the libraries that we use is, is how we implement that. And you can kind of imagine that C and C++, they sort of live close to the silicon. Uh, so they're not very user friendly. On the other hand, you have Python which is super user friendly. You can just go pip install whatever I need and it just works and, and I don't have to worry. Um, and so um, I think the innovation of Julia is, um, well, basically I, I don't think Julia developers are smarter than Python developers. So the bandwidth of Julia and Python, these bars here, they are in my cartoon, they're the same size. It's just a question of where you place them. So, um, we, Julia allows you to get a bit closer to the silicon by, by really natively interfacing with the C++ layer. Of course, it does sacrifice a little bit of user friendliness uh, in order to do that. And uh, for Py uh, workflows, this is super important because if you, um, so if you look at this table here, this is an experiment I did where I've got different function calls here. Uh, and I uh, built a PyBind 11 wrapper around them and I looked at the C call time and you can kind of see that um, by transitioning, by, by basically jumping off this end into the, the close to the silicon part, you're, prefer, you're paying a significant performance overhead in Python. Uh, not so much in Julia because you can make a native SQL. And this means that in Python, your workflow uh, tries to you know, push as much of the heavy lifting into another language, into the C uh, and, and all the, the logic that stays in Python. In Julia, these things can be much closer together. You can do C-level uh, performance on GPU, so CUDA-level performance on GPUs or C-level performance on CPUs without ever touching another language. And so uh, for the rest of this talk, I want to kind of create an inspirational example uh, of, of an application. And the way that uh, I've, I've uh, structured this application is you can kind of think of your HPC resources as being something like a workflow node, and that is interconnected with compute nodes using a high-speed high network. And so the user uh, uh, lives on the uh, uh, workflow node, the user specifies a workflow on the workflow node, sorry, and then you have software on each of the individual compute nodes, and uh, 
in, in this example, Jupyter is sort of the workflow engine. And then we have CUDA.jl uh, and Dagger and distributed.jl as our uh, software that glues everything together. Oops, I also want to mention um, that there's other uh, tools like Jack and kernel abstractions that provide portability. All right, let's start. Let's open our Jupyter notebook and uh, request some resources uh, from, uh, from uh, Perlmutter. So that line here is how you would ask for two compute nodes that are CPU nodes. And in this example, I wanted something real quick. So I asked for five minutes. And um, you can see it talks to Slurm and then eventually it, it, uh, it connects to the workers, excuse me. Uh, you might um, uh, wonder if it really is connected. So I've got this little script here. This script iterates over uh, each of the workers and this uh, spawn at macro um, issues the, fol the, the, the following function calls here on worker I. So basically I'm gonna get the host name and the PID on each worker and put them in an array called hosts and PIDs. And then when I print those out, I can see I'm on different nodes. I've got different PIDs. Uh, we can actually do some uh, work with this now. Um, uh, if I have a, uh, if, if I just want to um, uh, simulate uh, two times 10 to the eight many fair coin tosses, what I might do is I might just uh, write a for loop that iterates over uh, um, this many indices and just samples random numbers. And in distributed, uh, you would do the same. Uh, you would have the same loop structure. You just append that distributed macro. And anything that goes in parentheses here gets reduced with whatever is in the parentheses. So we're actually going to reduce this for loop um, using the addition uh, function. And so uh, let's look at the performance uh, gains. And with that, uh, we can use the benchmark tools library. So I can just benchmark my uh, uh, serial code and I get about 254 milliseconds per call. Uh, so 245. And then if I do it in parallel on two nodes, well, I get it, it's, it's a little bit then twice as fast. So um, there's not much communication here, so that's to be expected. All right. We can now start to also look at some of the awesome flexibility that having a high performance, uh, high productivity, uh, high performance language gives you. And that is let's mix some GPU and CPU jobs. And that's really, uh, it, it's fairly straightforward. We're gonna request some uh, uh, CPU nodes. We're gonna request some GPU nodes and they all get added to the same pool of workers. You might notice that my worker IDs, they start with two and three and then they become four and five. And in fact, I can go uh, and then run a function that just collects the Slurm features from each uh, instance. And I see that I have CPU Milan for the first two and then GPU uh, A100s uh, for the, the second two. All right, I am going to, given the time, I'm actually gonna skip that. You can look this up uh, later, but the point is we can actually hack in, in um, to, uh, Numa aware network topology into Julia. Um, all right, so let's uh, look at how we would actually program GPUs. So uh, if you don't want to go into the day, uh, weeds of GPU programming, you just want to do, you know, NumPy style GPU uh, arithmetic on GPUs, um, CUDA.jl um, and, and AMD GPU.jl and OneAPI.jl and so on have you covered there already. You can simply uh, generate, for example, two matrices, we can multiply them together. And um, uh, excuse me, this is uh, on a CPU. Uh, and then on a CPU, the multiply operator would automatically use uh, OpenBLAS. And we ta this takes about three milliseconds. Um, on CUDA, it's, it's very much the same thing. You can take the same arrays as you had before. You can copy them to device using the Q function. Uh, and then you can do the multiply uh, benchmark again, and now instead of 3.5 milliseconds, it takes uh, 121 microseconds without really changing. So, you know, the algorithm didn't change. You just had to change um, the data type of your uh, variable. All right. Of course, uh, 
if you want to go deeper, Julia lets you do that without having to touch any uh, backend library. So uh, I can write a CUDA style uh, kernel. It uses the same, it borrows the same uh, terminology that, that CUDA uh, has. So you can get block ID and uh, grid dimension and so on. And, and here, all I'm doing is I'm, I'm striding over an array and I'm applying the sign function. <clears throat> Now this is a, a Julia sign function, right? So, so what, what CUDA.jl will actually do is it will con compile that using LLVM to uh, device code and then execute that on the device in this uh, kernel. So what we would do is the same thing again, we, we generate some data on the device. I'm just doing random data, but um, Julia has this nice notation for very large numbers, by the way, you can just put underscores uh, and then uh, we create an output array that's the same dimension as the input array. And then we can use the add CUDA uh, macro to generate the kernel uh, code and then run it on 256 threads. And you know it tells you, okay, I've got a, a host kernel. Anyway, um, it also allows you to profile things so that you can see that you're making progress. Um, so uh, this is just a quick example. So I can just uh, profile Metmol and um, well, uh, you know, this is, I, I really encourage you to, to explore these things. By the way, these profiles are exported as pandas data frames. So that's kind of fun. Um, anyway. And if you're really, really interested in getting really deep into the weeds, you can inject LLVM IR into the LLVM output of uh, Julia. So this, I, I'm not gonna go th through all of this, but um, you can do fun things like um, add uh, unroll expressions directly um, uh, to your code. So this will do uh, explicit um, loop unrolling and you can add in this example, LVM uh, contracts uh, to your, uh, in this case, plus minus and uh, so plus times and minus functions. Um, and so then every time later you use those functions, these contracts are automatically injected into the LLVM code stream. All right. So I've gone through a, a very quickly through a lot of, uh, you know, this is what the language can do. I, I kind of want to help you sort of just put this into some context. And this is a project that I've been working with Soham Ghosh, uh, also at, at, uh, at NERSC on and that is looking at machine learning and particles and potentials. So, um, well, let's just think about if, I, if I'm a theoretical physicist, I like a really simple model. So uh, if I, if I kind of imagine things like chemical reactions and protein conformations and anything that's, that's in sort of change state, that can often be described as um, you have some potential that represents uh, the physics, and then a particle that can transition between the different states. Uh, so here, uh, we, we just very briefly will, will gloss over a stochastic uh, uh, differential equation integrator um, for um, like Witten and Julia. It's, uh, you'd write it in a very similar way in, in Python, but uh, so it's, uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward if, if you do this stuff already. So um, you would, have uh, you use random and distributions to create random numbers. And it's fairly easy uh, to do that in Julia. Um, and then you would start defining your physics. And, and also all of this here is the way you would sort of write, like you'd open a physics paper and you, you, you write, would write into your computer the algorithm to integrate a particular kind of stochastic differential equation. Um, uh, and uh, I just really bring this slide up, excuse me. Um, just to show that stochastic differential equation integrator can be can be very subtle, and therefore it's very helpful to have an interactive language to to sort of uh, to explore what your algorithm does, um, and and not have to then re-implement that that algorithm. Imagine having to re-implement this algorithm in C. All right, and so the reason why we really care about this in physics is. Um, if you kind of look at this uh, time evolution of my particle position as a function of time, um, then I'm going to have to simulate often hundreds of millions of data points in order to capture a few thousand transitions from one state to another. And a few thousand, if you know a little bit about statistics, that's okay, but still bad statistics. So, uh, so we really care about how can, we, how can we improve the performance of these algorithms, especially how can we kind of improve not needing to do this stuff here. So, uh, so that's what really the rest of this talk is about. Um, 
uh, we were exploring this this algorithm where we would do local Monte Carlo sampling around, like we, we've got a pilot trajectory and then we do local Monte Carlo sampling. And the way you would do that is normally you would have your, your integrator running up here and then later you would uh, go over the trajectory and you have the integrator run again, but for short trajectories uh, for each data point. So this can be super expensive. And so uh, we care about optimizing this part. So yeah, the idea here is you basically, you perturb your path a little bit uh, at, at, at certain time points and see what happens. And, and uh, the thing that we really care about here is uh, you can imagine if I'm like blue, the, the fat blue line is my pilot trajectory. And, and over here, for example, most of my ensemble actually has gone and like spread out lots. So these would be borderline states where we have to be very careful. And down here we have stable states where we might use a much cheaper algorithm uh, to, to integrate the problem. Uh, and um, uh, the way that this looks in a phase space, if you have the position and, and velocity of your particle, you can kind of see that if I color code each position on the phase space uh, based on how much these localized Monte Carlo samples have spread out, uh, you can kind of see that there are like stable points and, and less stable points here. And so uh, let's see if we can learn something about this using machine learning. So um, flux.jl is uh, Julia's version of PyTorch basically. Um, it's uh, in, in true Julia fashion, it, it basically just sees, is CUDA available? If so, I'm start gonna start using CUDA. If not, I'll just run on the CPU. <clears throat> and also because the way we've built, uh, so the way we've configured CUDA.jl on, on Perlmutter, as long as you're on Perlmutter, if you import CUDA, then it will automatically pick up the local installation uh, and not uh, try and bring in its own version of CUDA, which might not work well with the hardware that we have available. The user had to do nothing here. Just This just happens automatically. All right, so how would you define a, a machine learn, learning problem in Julia? Hmm. The, it's basically the same as PyTorch, but the thing that you might notice is uh, Julia's column major ordering, right? So in PyTorch, you would have um, each row would be a data point and each column is, is a, a dimension in your input vector. In Julia, it's the other way around. Uh, and, and you'll see that in a second. So what we will do uh, first is we'll get our positions and velocities. Um, it's from that phase space that I showed earlier. We uh, concatenate them horizontally. So positions, velocities, uh, and um, then we basically use the spreading out of my local Monte Carlo ensemble. Uh, this is the, also a, a metric of the Lyapunov rate. Uh, we use that to classify each point. So basically we will create a, a, a vector um, of classes. We start with zero and whenever the spreading rate is greater than two, we label it one. And whenever the spreading rate is greater than three, we label it two. You might've noticed all the, the pe periods here. Um, these are um, uh, element-wise uh, broadcasting over vectors. So the, this is actually a, a for loop here that goes over the vector and compares each element and then assigns each element according to this Boolean index. Uh, we, will, um, we can then define a neural network. That's pretty uh, straightforward. Um, we, I recommend you use the chain macro and then you can just list the different layers that you have and then chain just concatenates and feeds the results into each other. You, um, I'm also going to get, uh, uh, yeah. And then what you'll will find is once you've got your model, the way the model is constructed is it takes a two dimensional number, position and velo velocity and produces three variables. These are the uh, relative probabilities of each class that it thinks it's in. So uh, zero for stable, uh, one for uh, uh, metastable and then uh, two for board, uh, for unstable. All right, so um, you can use the flux data loader to just automatically uh, con um, combine your, um, uh, your, your, your labeled data set um, and, and break it up into batches. And you might also notice all of these, these little pipeline things here. These are, um, your, um, these, these are what are called pipeline operators. And what they actually just do is they take all of this data here and move it to GPU. 
All right, and then this is how you would run a, a training loop. Uh, it's it's actually an explicit training loop. You can actually take everything that's inside the inner loop and just call flux or train on it. But I wanted to collect the the losses, so I've explicitly written it like that. And then when we're done with that, um, we can we can build our classifier here, uh, and that just takes the the uh, probabilities um, as a um, so you, you take the it takes some input coordinates moves into the GPU runs the model moves it to the CPU and then based on each probability you've picked the largest one and that's going to be your inferred class and this is what we get in the end of it uh, so what do we see here the first thing is these are our input data this is uh, how the neural network classifier has inferred the class of each of the input data. And then I just take uh, uh, 10,000 random numbers, spread them evenly across the face space and ask the classifier what it thinks. And what it actually tells you is you've got two basins that are stable here. You've got some meta stable states in between, and then you have a region of instability. So this is uh, going. this would then be the input for your acceleration strategy. If you're in here, just Use a fast, non-accurate algorithm. When you get to this uh, orange line here, at that point, you use your expensive but accurate integration algorithms. And uh, now, what we can do in addition to machine learning is we can use uh, dagger.jl to uh, improve the um, to, to improve our um, uh, 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 our integrator by just breaking up the tasks, in, uh, breaking up each step into what are called tasks and then um, using Dagger to parallelize all of those tasks. Um, I'm going to just quickly skip the uh, Matmol example. Um, it's Matmol, it's faster with Dagger, use it. Uh, the way that Dagger works, and I think this is also very uh, natural for workflows, is it's a task-based uh, parallelism algorithm. So uh, in Dagger, you use uh, dagger.spawn to create a task. A task is non-blocking that starts immediately. So in this example here, you can see that the task has started. It takes 10 seconds to complete. So we'll have printed 10, uh, nine falses, sorry, 10 falses and, and one true. And um, uh, so uh, this is just a quick example here that uh, runs some work in, uh, on, on the, in different tasks. But what it does is it also keeps track of the ID of the processor that it was running on. So um, if I just, uh, you can kind of imagine, I've got a for loop like this. Um, and uh, for each, uh, so, so now I can t identify each expensive function like this function, this function here. And I will just uh, put a dagger that spawn around it, and dagger automatically uh, maps out the dependencies and knows when to block what. Um, and so, if I just run this, you can see, oops, you can see here I, I've got a data frame of all the uh, outputs here from my for loop, and I was running each one of these on a different processor. Uh, I didn't have to change my algorithm though. I still had the same loop, for loop, nested for loop that I would have used uh, in my uh, serial example. Um, and I will, uh, I've got two minutes to, to point out uh, one last thing. If we go back to our um, particle in a potential example, here's the serial version, right? You do N uh, steps, then you start an ensemble simulation and then you aggregate data. If I naively uh, parallelize that with Dagger, so basically I've got the same algorithm as before, uh, just where my mouse is here, I'm gonna put a dagger.spawn, um, and then I'm gonna fetch all the data. I, am I gonna be faster? Well, um, uh, the serial example took 50 milliseconds to run, the parallelized example to two seconds. So no, you have wasted a lot of compute by uh, using too many kernel launches and too much data movement. Uh, I'm, I'm not gonna go over this uh, uh, example here, um, but you can look it up in the slides later. But the point is if you fuse, uh, if, you, if you make sure that each work has enough work by fusing several ensemble runs together, in that case, um, you will then get uh, a speed up of two X uh, here and actually much better scaling uh, behavior. But so the, the um, the conclusion here is 
spread work intelligently using Dagger. Um, keep your workers busy, basically. All right, and that already brings me to my conclusions. I'm just going to leave this slide up here. Uh, on the online uh, document, I also have a, um, a, a review of a lot of Julia packages for different data and HPC topics. So please take a look at that if you're interested. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. So there's a couple questions online. Are there any questions in the room or anyone want to speak up with a question? Um, Andrew. I guess how how widespread is junior adoption? Do you feel like it is it is growing more than one today? Seeing it a lot more. Um the question was how widespread is Julia adoption? Um it I, it is actually growing. Of course, with every growth curve, you can fix uh, fit an exponential to it. Uh, so um, I'm, I'm not going to infer whether it's the beginning of an exponential explosion, but it is growth. Um, what we've seen, for example, is the Julia for HPC um, uh, buff at supercomputing has been growing. Uh, the first one had about 40 people. The, the one after that was roughly 60 people. And just recently, we had 100 people in our boss. Um, so this is, uh, sorry, 120. This is online and um, uh, in person. Um, so I, I think the community, um, I, I think your, your question is like, when should I start using Julian? Uh, there, there are a lot of projects that, that I know that actually combine existing code, actually Calling C is trivial from Julia. So if you've got a C or a Fortran code, uh, it, it's actually pretty easy to do. It's actually harder to call Python code, but I've seen Julia plus Python projects. And then a lot of adoption is from new grad students that are starting projects and that are weighing the pros and cons of Julia and Jupyter, uh, sorry, Julia and Python, uh, and, and choosing Julia because of this HPC awareness. So for example, a liquid is av available in uh, Julia. So Liquid is a low level um, performance profiling and, and tracing tool. There's also thread pinning and, and all, all kinds of things that, that let you, in HW lock, that let you talk to HPC resources natively. Uh, and, and that's usually when, when folks adopt Julia. Um, yeah. Well, great. Yeah, well, thanks again.